My Govan, and welcome to the Tolkien Lore Channel. I'm the Tolkien Geek, and in this video, I'm going to show you how you can start writing in Elvish. Technically, that's not correct. I'm going to show you how to write using the Feanorian alphabet, not in the Elvish language, uh, but your friends don't have to know that. <laughs> uh, and in fact, it's usually easier to just say that you're writing in Elvish because to get into the explanation of the fact that you're actually just using an elfish alphabet to you to you know write in the English language is kind of overly pedantic anyway and that's really what people care about is the fact that you're using the script not what language you're writing in uh, but it, it's really easy to kind of get lost in that too because the elvish language and the elf el elven alphabet are distinct things but they are also very connected in most people's minds, which is kind of funny because a lot of the time we see that the Elvish characters, we're actually seeing them representing English sounds uh, and English words, and I'm going to get into that a little bit. In fact, as a background to this video, you might want to check, uh, I think I've done two videos before where I translated, quote-unquote, um, two or three different things in the Lord of the Rings, like the actual front, the title page, where there's some elven characters that actually get into, like, the huge long title of the book, uh, that if you've ever, you know, really gotten nerdy and, and tried to decipher that yourself, you've figured it out. The Door of Moria is one, I don't remember if I actually covered that in a video, because it's kind of done for you already. Um, the inscription on Balin's tomb, I think, is one that I covered, and I might have done one or two other things too, but the point is, those kind of give you a pretty good idea of how those different characters can represent sounds that are translated in different ways. So the Doors of Moria have Elvish characters that are representing Elvish words, and in fact, if you look at the Door of Moria inscription, which is in every copy of The Lord of the Rings, Gandalf gives the common speech translation, but what actually happens on the door itself, the image that's in the book, it shows you the actual Elvish characters on the door, and then it also says, it's, it actually tells you what's written on the door, and it gives the Elvish of that. So, you know, that's one way to do it. But on the title page, it's actually using the Elvish characters to represent English words, which don't have to be translated, they just have to be deciphered in the sense that the characters are not familiar to us, but once you understand what each character represents in terms of sounds, you just read it. It's not really any more complicated than that. Whereas with the door, you have to understand the sounds, and then you have to understand what the words mean, because the words are in Elvish, not in English. So with that as a background, and like I said, you might want to look at those other videos first, so if you did that already, then now you're in a good place to start, and if you're, you know, kind of familiar already, cool. What I'm going to be focusing on here is not the kirth, or the, you know, the ones that we tend to associate with dwarves, the ones that are really angular, but the Feanorian script, which is found in the uh, appendix to The Lord of the Rings, and which is, in my opinion at least, much the more beautiful way to write anyway. <laughs> and it's also somewhat more organized, let's say. Um, it's, it's really fascinating to me how Tolkien managed, on the one hand, to create an alphabet which is simultaneously very structural and mathematic, almost, in the way that it's organized, and on the other hand, extremely beautiful, and, you know, you just, you don't even care that it's very mathematically organized, because you don't see it that way when you're just seeing it in writing. Uh, but as a brief overview, so I'm going to show the actual table of the Feanorian characters here on screen, so you can look along. If you're watching the podcast version, you know, use, you know, grab your copy of The Lord of the Rings, find the page in the appendix, and actually look at it. But the basic idea here is there's four columns, and there's kind of two boxes. The, the top box has four letters in each column or six, uh, and then there's a bottom one that's kind of like irregular letters, you might say, or irregular characters, and here we have to remember that in, for us English speakers especially, 
many languages out there that have written alphabets do not use them in the way that English speakers do. In English, for example, the letter C can be a S or a K, or it can be combined with H to make a CH. Whereas in most written languages, well, at least I think it's most, maybe not, uh, but in my experience, the ones that I have encountered outside the English you know, language, most of them are much more, there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the written character and the sound. So, for example, in Spanish, O is always O. C is always K. You know, I mean, it's there's no S sound for C in Spanish. That's not how it works. English is one of the few languages, I think, that does that, and that partially has to do with the history of English and how, you know, so many different languages melded into it, but that's neither here nor there for the purposes of this video. So the way this is organized in Tolkien's table here, each column, at least in the top box, represents a type of letter sound. So, for example, one column might be the dentals, which would be like your D, your T, you know, things that you use your teeth in the formation of that sound. Another one might be your gutturals, like your K or your G, things that you kind of make towards the back of your mouth and your throat. So that's the way that Tolkien organizes this, and he, in the appendix, gives an example of like the most common usage of the letters, how they would tend to sound in the Sindarin that was common at the time of the Lord of the Rings. And, you know, that uses one particular column as the dentals, another one as the gutturals, and another one as the fricative, whatever. But he also says you can kind of used these in other ways, and they were adapted in different ways to different languages. So the Quenya way of using these letters would have been different from the Sindarin way of using these letters, for example. Then there's another layer of complexity, because the vowels get different representation depending on what language, again, is being used, and in what mode they are being used. And when Tolkien talks about modes, this goes back to what I was saying earlier about the translation being into Elvish or being into English. That's one way of thinking of modes. So you can use the Tinguar in an English mode to just represent English sounds and write English words with the Elvish characters. Or you can use it in the Sindarin mode, which is to you know, use it as actually representing Elvish words, which you then have to translate. Another way of thinking of modes, though, and this becomes increasingly important in the <laughs> example of the Moria Gate, is the mode of Beleriand, as Gandalf calls it, is one in which the vowels are all represented by independent letter signs. Those vowel sounds have their own independent characters, whereas in some modes of using the Feanorian script, vowels are actually represented by diacritics, little marks above the consonant consonantal letters. So, and he also gives the, he gives examples of how this would be used. So like a, a single little acute accent, what we would think of as an acute accent above a consonant would be an, an I sound, a short I sound, so E, or a three dots, which you, you know, frequently see, uh, would be a ah sound. So that's, you know, kind of how you could do it in one way. And even this gets some variation because the vowels aren't always the same. The vowels could be different. So the three dots could be an O sound instead of the ah. You know, you could do it different ways. Then there's also the problem of does the vowel come before or after the consonant that it's over? And this is another point of variation. And this, Tolkien says, you would, depending on the language being spoken, if it's a language in which vowels tend to start words or in which they tend to come very commonly at the end of words, that might determine which way you want to go with that. So, for example, if we were to use the Elvish characters in a Spanish mode, you may have noticed that Spanish, they never begin a word with sp, so España, Español, right? And if you talk to a native Spanish speaker, they will have a really hard time saying English words that begin with sp or sk or anything like that. And so a Spanish speaker who tries to say Spain in English will probably say Espain, you know. And so in a case like that, you would probably put your vowel mark above the consonant that follows the vowel. Whereas if you're doing a different language where it's very common for vowels to end a word, 
you might want to put it put the vowel mark above the consonant that precedes the vowel. And then there's you know it also he also talks about in terms of like the different ways to do the vowels, the O and the U. You know, in some languages, the O is more common than the U, and in some, the U is more common. So he gives the example, like the black speech, the more common is the U, and so the one particular mark gets used for a U, whereas in Sindarin, the more common to use the O, and so that same mark that would be a U in the black speech is an O in Sindarin. So there's all these different moving parts, and this is why it's so customizable. It's kind of designed to be customizable, but it's also extremely organized, which helps to learn it a little bit better. Now, for purposes of using this in your own writing, and I used to do this, actually. I kept a journal in Elvish, or, you know, Tinguar, for a while. Uh, and then I finally gave it up because I just had so many other things on my plate that <laughs> finding the time to scrawl out, you know, legible Tinguar just was a little bit too much. Uh, but it's quite fun, and it's actually very cathartic in some ways, because you have to think about what you're writing, but it's kind of a nice thing to see once you're done, because it looks so dang pretty. Uh, but the idea would be, if you're going to use it in English, one way that you can kind of help yourself remember might be to try to match the way that the Elvish characters look with some of the way that English letters look to match some of the sounds. You can't do this you know, uniformly for sure, but you can to a certain extent. And a good example of that would be to think of the B and the D. B and D are flips of each other. They're mirror images of each other, at least the lowercase B and D, right? And the lowercase B and D also look remarkably like two of the Feanorian characters. So you could use those two columns as, you know, one of them is your dentals and one of them is your labials, which is your ba, ma, wa, you know, that sort of thing. So you've got, you know, you could start by trying to do that. And if you're not an English speaker, of course, using the English alphabet, then, you know, ignore this, uh, which, you know, you may be speaking Spanish and using the same kind of alphabet, which is really a Roman language alphabet that's just been kind of modified over time. If you're, you know, if you're, say, Russian, you know, your alphabet, alphabet looks radically different. And so <laughs> that may not help you much. But if you're listening to this in English, which I assume the vast majority of my listeners and viewers are, that's one way that you could start, at least, trying to learn it. And from there, it's really kind of up to you how you want to do it. You can, you know, do a lot of things that are really just kind of your own idea, but... I kind of recommend going with what Tolkien goes with in the appendix where he's explaining the kind of common usage of the letters because that way you always have a handy reference. Or you can do what I did and write out, you know, your own alphabet with sound equivalency. Now, the thing you have to remember here is you don't get... Uh, you could do this one of two ways. One way that you could do it is just simply do a letter-for-letter letter equation, but I prefer to try to keep it the way that Tolkien intended the alphabet to be used, which is each character represents a sound, not a letter. And so, for example, the I sound that we make in English isn't represented by a single letter in the Elvish. It's just not. It doesn't exist except as a diphthong, which means two vowels put together. And that would be one way of doing that would be to have, you know, your your triple dot for A and then an I sign over it, which is another dot. I think I said earlier it's an acute mark. That's actually the E, the E sound. I made a mistake earlier. Um, but you could do it that way or you could do it other ways. I mean, there's things that Tolkien goes into as far as how the different sounds work. There's like a little sign that you can put under a letter to say to signify that it's a doubled sound. It's just kind of a, or not under the letter, but like just above the curly Q parts of it, the, the two curves or one curve, depending on which letter you're looking at. And again, you know, definitely read the appendix to get all the details because I can't really effectively show all this entirely on screen. But there's different ways of doing this. But if you're going to do it like I do or did, for a sound equivalence rather than a letter equivalence, you have to really think about which letter makes which sound and how then do I make that work in terms of 
doing the different sounds that we have in English that aren't single letter sounds in the Elvish character. Diphthongs being one of those examples. Another one that Tolkien talks about is adding an S after another consonant, so like X or TS. So KS or TS. KS we just usually represent with a single letter X, but there is no letter X in the Elvish character because that's technically two sounds. So what Tolkien does for this is he adds a little downward sloping curly Q at the end of the consonant and just kind of attaches it to the bottom right of the consonant. And so that's just how he represents adding that last little S sound, which doesn't necessarily happen all that often, but you do find it in cases like, um, I'm trying to remember what the word, I may not be able to remember it off the top of my head, but I want to say there's a word where there's a TS and then something else, and I just can't, I can't come up with it right now. Uh, well, there is also the Helkaraxe, right? The the grinding ice of the north. So that wouldn't be the uh, the x is is represented in the text as just an X for the you know the simplicity of presenting it to an English reader. But if it was written in an Elvish script, Helkaraxe would actually be a letter for the h, huh, a letter for the e, the e, and then the l, and then the k, and then the a, ah, er, ah, and then you would have the k sound again with the little curly q and then whatever represents the e sound so it'd be either you'd have a little i type thing with the diacritic over it depending on you know if it was one where the vowel sound came above the consonant that it preceded or if it was a language in which it's you know the vowel comes over the the consonant which it follows then it would just be over the k so there's different ways of doing that there's also ways of lengthening the vowels. So in the O or U case, you kind of have the upward sloping curly Q, which might be upward sloping to the right or to the left, depending on which letter you're talking about. And you kind of double the curly Q at the end. Or if it's a standalone, you would put instead of like a kind of a short I, it would be more like a J without a dot and then whatever uh, vowel is supposed to be over that. And then there's... Of course, the mode of Beleriand is different because the vowels, like I pointed out, are separate and distinct from, you know, the consonants. They are their own letters. And, you know, just for reference, again, showing on the screen, here's the door of Moria. And you can see where, if you pay careful attention to the different Elvish words that are told, it's told to us what at the bottom of the page, what the Elvish words are. You can very easily compare that to what's in the top and figure out, okay, this one is an E, this one is a Y, this one is an O. You can just compare, and it's really simple. What I like to do, and what I originally did whenever I started doing this, I basically wrote the English alphabet out, and then I put above each what that letter would be in the Elvish, you know, what Elvish character would match that. Now, of course, you can't rely completely on that because A, B, C, D, you're, all, you're off to a bad start with A because A is automatically a, well, is it A or is it A or is it A or is it... <laughs> so you have this problem immediately. So I stick with, you know, like the, the base sound that Tolkien would have for each vowel. And then I went and I basically just added some extra ones for the alternate sounds. So it would be the over the a would be just the ah and then i would have to show elsewhere where the diphthongs are okay this diphthong makes a this diphthong makes whatever and then there's ah which doesn't even appear in the elvish sound elvis doesn't seem to have an elvish i mean a, a sound for ah at all so i had to kind of just modify that and say that a short ah a short ah rather is ah but in any case you know, you have to figure out how this works together. And I'm not going to show you my own way because if somebody, you know, somehow manages to get their hand on my journal, then I'm not going to give them a way to read it. Uh, but the idea here would be you just, you know, sometimes you have to fudge things around just a little bit to make some of these things work, particularly with English. Because, again, English has such a hodgepodge of sounds and things that it's collected from different 
you know, languages over the centuries that English has been developing. So you've got all this going together, but then, you know, you get past A, it gets a little easier, you get B, and then that's, you know, one character. C, then you have to be like, okay, am I putting the S sound here or the K sound here? Now, so I would recommend doing this for whatever alphabet you're doing, but I would also recommend if your alphabet is English or, you know, like English in which a language can, it, it, the language in which you're working can have multiple sounds attached to one particular letter, I would also repeat the actual Elvish table and put next to that which sounds are going to you know, be represented by that character. Because if you do just the one-to-one -one with your own alphabet to the Elvish characters, you're probably going to run out of alphabet before you run out of Elvish characters. Of course, there's no rule that says you have to use all the Elvish characters, but depending on how you're using it, you know, running out of your own alphabet before you run out of Elvish characters may be a bad thing because there's more sounds to be represented than there are letters in your alphabet. Conversely, if you have a an alphabet that is very phonetic in in its usage, one that, you know, there's one letter for one sound, you may run out of elvish characters before you run out of sounds. Because again, if you have a lot of diphthongal sounds like I, A, you know, things like this, E, I would be A in Tolkien's usage, A, I would be I, you know, that sort of thing, you may run out of elvish characters before you run out of alphabet. So, you know, just make it work however you need to make it work, but I would recommend doing both, you know, having your own alphabet written out as normal and then match it to Elvish characters written above it or to the side or whatever and then reproduce his table and match sounds you know and I'll show an example of what that might look like on the screen too just to make it a little easier but once you have those basic sounds down especially the consonants the consonants are by and large the easier ones because you don't have the variety of consonantal sounds you have mostly one sound to one sound for the the consonants that tends to be the case not always. Again, C can be S or K in English, not so much in Elvish, but you can make that work really easily because in English you just, you know, kind of either skip over C or you put a note saying C, S, and K, you know, or something like that because S and K already represent the two sounds that C makes. You also have to be careful with things like S because S in English can be S or Z depending on where it falls and how it, you know, where it is in a word. So, again, you also have to be careful there because that's technically two different sounds in Elvish, and one of them is really the Z sound. Also, if you have the Z form of S, that technically doesn't fall into that diacritic, not diacritic, but that little curly Q, that downward sloping curly Q that goes for the S sound after a T or a K or whatever. That's really only for s. So you can either come up with your own similar curly Q to be a Z, or you can just write the Z sound after it, which would be a really unusual thing in Elvish. But then once you've kind of established, okay, here's the consonants, here's how I can work the vowels, diphthongal sounds, all that stuff, then just start practice writing. And more than likely what you're going to find is they're probably things you haven't thought of. So just find lengthy passages that you can practice writing out. And as you come along difficulties, you may have to stop and think and go, I hadn't accounted for that in my system. Now, how do I make this work? Or, you know, I thought I had this problem solved, but this actually doesn't quite fit. So now I need to rethink that problem and how to solve it. And then, you know, as you do more and more stuff over time, you will eventually really refine down your usage of the Elvish characters and get to a point where you're really comfortable with, this is how it all works. And this is why you have to kind of just practice for a while and, and try to use, you know, a lot of different things, writing long passages with lots of different sounds, so that eventually you kind of cover most of your bases and realize okay, I hadn't thought of that sound, I hadn't, you know, considered this combination, I hadn't, you know, and figure out. And the other thing, too, is you may, at first blush, depending on which language you're working in, think, okay, 
if I'm going to use diacritics for my vowels, I want them to come over the consonant that the vowel comes before. And then as you go along, you may realize, actually, there's more words that go the other way, and I should probably change that so that the vowel comes over the consonant that it follows. You know? And this is just kind of a thing that you learn by experience because it's not something most of us think of every day. I gave the example of Spanish earlier because that's one that I just happen to know from experience you, know, that you have this kind of problem. Like, like Spanish speakers do not like to start with certain consonantal combinations but that kind of thing exists in other languages too where i mean you're going to have languages where it's really rare for something to end in a consonant or a vowel or whichever it is italian for instance when i was studying english in college one of the things that we learned was that it's really easy to write rhyming couplets in italian because they end like most <laughs> italian i don't remember if it was nouns or words generally whatever it is but they all end in like one of two vowel sounds and so not all literally but so many of them do that it just makes it really easy to find rhymes but that means that italian is ending in a vowel sound very frequently and so you may want to have a system in which if you're writing in italian your you know vowel falls on the consonant that it that the vowel follows so you know just depending on your language but again some languages it's not quite so easy and so as you start writing more and more you start to realize okay i'm having to add in additional vowel mark you know holders in more and more places than i really would have thought and so maybe i should rethink how i'm using the diacritics you can avoid that problem entirely by using the mode of Balerian and having separate letters for the sounds, but then you still have to figure out the diphthongs. Now that, you know, you could do that one of two ways. You could have the diphthong represented by just two vowels following each other, you know, one following the other. You could have a vowel with another vowel over it to represent the diphthongal aspect. You could do anything you want. I mean, there's so many ways you can do this. Have fun. Do it your way. It's kind of designed to be customizable, so customize it. That's the fun of it. You could do whatever you want with it, and, you know, you can use it to keep your own private journal. You can use it to pass secret messages with your friends. You can, you know, do all kinds of things. I actually tried to get some friends of mine from law school to start, you know, writing Tinguar with me. It never really caught on. Not really a surprise who had time for that in law school. But, you know, there's just so many different things you can do. And like I said, it, to me, it really was kind of a cathartic experience writing a journal this way. Because not only are you writing your journal, which is kind of cathartic anyway... But even though you're taking a lot of time and having to think about it, especially when you first get started, you know, you have to remind yourself, what was this sound? <laughs> but once you get going, you still have to think about it a little bit because it's not natural to write those letters. But if you take your time and do it with enough care that they look nice when you're done, then you can see the finished product staring at you and go, I did that. That looks kind of nice. You know, and it's, it's really nice to do that because then it's not only have you written something in your own hand, but you've done it in a way that looks really nice too. You know, credit to Tolkien. He came up with a really beautiful alphabet, and that's part of the reason why I like using it is because it's just so lovely. And that's, you know, one final point here. There are so many different ways of writing these characters, even on top of just how to use them in terms of what sounds they represent, if you look at the different examples, compare the Moriador, for instance, to the the letters on the title page and the lettering for the ring. The lettering for the ring is extremely calligraphic. Calligraphic? I don't know how to word, how you'd say that word. It looks like really, really fancy calligraphy. The stuff on the title page looks a lot more like print, and then the Moriador is kind of like just cursive because it looks like it was written with just one stroke in a lot of the time without ever lifting anything off the, not paper. I mean, for Tolkien it was paper, but for Celebrimbor or for Narvi, whoever actually carved the thing, it's like they never took the stone chisel off the thing until they finished a word. So there's even different ways of writing it, and, you know, find the one that you like most. You can make it look really, really fancy. You can make it look really, really basic. You can do something in between. It's totally up to you, and this is... 
why I love this alphabet so much. It's so cool that you can adapt it to pretty much any usage that you really want. So that's my kind of lesson on how you can use and customize Tinguar for your own benefit, for your own use, for whatever you want to do with it. You know, if you're into that kind of thing, again, it's not hard to learn. It just takes a little practice to get used to writing it and thinking in terms of that phonetic alphabet if that's the way you're going to use it. Now, you could use it, like I said, as a, you know, just I'm going to substitute this letter for this letter and not really think about the sounds so much. But I think that's kind of a boring way to do it. But that's just, you know, that's my opinion. If you want to do it that way, again, do whatever you want. That's kind of how they're supposed to be used anyway. They're supposed to be customized. So I just really like the fact that you can take it in whatever direction you please and it it just works. You can make it work for pretty much anything. So hope you enjoyed that. Hope it gave you some ideas if you're really interested in trying to write in Ting Tinguar and it seems daunting. It's really not. It's really pretty simple. In fact, I don't even want to give too many specific examples and I haven't given too many specific examples here precisely because it's so easy that it's like I can't teach it to you it's actually just there for you to start doing it's just how you want to do it so I hope this kind of gets you over any hurdles that you might have been you know trying to get over yourself if you were interested in doing this and just hadn't got the gumption up just start doing it you know get work out the system that you think you want to use first practice it some work out the kinks and you're off to the races it's good stuff. So, if you did enjoy that, please give it a like, share it around, especially with anybody else who might be interested in learning to write Tinguar or Elvish. Again, your friends don't have to know you're not writing in Elvish. Uh, <laughs> otherwise, do remember to check the description for social and other links. Follow me on the platform formerly known as Twitter for Tolkien-related trivia questions. And until the next time, I'm the Tolkien Geek, signing out for the Tolkien Lore Channel. Namariye. Thanks to all my channel supporters, especially Paul Leone, Nathan Dufour, and Robert Kindling.